All right, this is a really big one for me, my friends. I can't even properly describe the honor it is for me to have Jeremy Shep on this program. One of the last good, ethical, powerful, respected sports journalists left in North America, if you ask me, a man that I've looked up to for well over two decades, a man who has had, unbeknownst to him, a massive influence on my career, not only him, but his late great father as well, the legendary Dick Shap. And uh, I will get into some other things that I want to say to him because I've been waiting to do this for quite some time. But without further ado, here he is. You know him from E60, Outside the Lines, ESPN, multiple time Emmy winner, multiple time author. I mean, a true living legend, Jeremy Shap. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Wow, I, really, I, I can't tell you how flattered I am. And, um, uh, I can only say uh, that you must be delusional and, uh, and the checks in the mail, but no, it, it means so much to me. And uh, I respect you so much, the work you've done, uh, for lack of a better word, the brand that you have built, the credibility you have in the industry. Um, I, I treasured those times we got to work together at ESPN and, and I'm, I'm really honored to be here on the show. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that coming from you. But this isn't about me. This is about you. So I, I do want to tell you about a couple of things as to why you and your family mean so much to me. And I know this isn't your typical way to start an interview, but I do think it's important. First of all, your father is someone that I admired from afar. Obviously, I never had a chance to meet him so much so. I loved the sports reporters as a kid that I completely ripped it off later in life. Um, and I called You're it. You're not the only I, one. A hundred percent. But it is the the genuine article. It's the real deal. It's the first of its kind. I did a show called the MMA Beat, play on words, you know, the beat that we covered, but also beat where it was four journalists sitting around talking about mixed martial arts. I played the role of Dick Shap one tenth as good as he did the job. Um, and so he- I'm sure much better than he would have played on that show, however. Sure. That is, although he was a great, you know, a big time fight fan, I know as That's well. That's true. That's um, true. So that meant a lot uh, to try to, you know, play the role of, of Dick Shap. And then I, um, you know, learned about you and followed your work and admired your work. Uh, late 90s, I believe, would see, oh, that's Dick Shap's son. He's still composed. He's so young. What a great voice. What a, what, what a, like, it's just so impressionable. But I have to tell you something, Jeremy, and I don't know if I had a chance to tell you this um, the few times that we got to work together. The piece that you did on Bobby Fischer, which I know you have received a ton of accolades for, you won the award named after your father for outstanding writing um, for the great work that you did on that piece. When I was in college, I probably watched that piece and especially the final exchange between you and Bobby Fischer over a hundred times. And throughout my career, I have been asked, you know, I've had moments where there's these big fighters who are mad at me in my face or a Dana White, some, uh, you know, an imposing figure in my face. And they've always asked me, how do you remain so calm? What are you thinking about? What are you feeling in that moment? And on my life, what I think about is you in that moment. I learned in that moment watching you how to be composed in a tense situation, how to stand your ground, how to own the room and not let someone walk over you. So I just want to thank you for that. Even oh. in preparation for this, I probably watched it another 10 times. And I would urge anyone who has not seen that piece called Finding Bobby Fisher, which I believe you did back in 2003, if memory serves. Five. Five, Five, excuse me. Yeah. Um, one of the finest pieces of journalism that I've ever seen. So I just oh, wanted to say that to I, you off the top. I, I'm very... I'm very flattered. I'm very grateful. Um, that piece was uh, something I still think about a lot. It's been uh, a long time. It's been 17 years. But you know the the way that um, you think about it, it's kind of the way I think about it too. You know, when people ask me, "What are the pieces that really matter to you?" You know, w when you've done thousands of them, you know what what stands out. And that piece, for so many reasons. Um, I think it, it resonates um, with other people, clearly with you, and it resonates with me. And and it's interesting, right? Because Ariel, right? We we talk about in journalism, it's not about you. It's not about the journalist or the reporter. It's about the subject. And I certainly um, grew up in the business, uh, I think, believing that and adhering to it. And then at the end of the day, some of the pieces that uh, – matter the most that really get to the heart of the matter are the personal ones. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I wouldn't say, I don't think anybody could say that I made it about me. Uh, I think that Bobby Fisher did about me and my father in that situation. But uh, that is one of the ironies. 
One thing I've always wondered about that piece, it ends with you walking off after you have that great line. Um, you know, you're not sure if he had done anything on that day to disprove anything that your father had said about him, saying that he didn't have a same bone in his body, which really bothered him. What happened afterwards? Did you run into him at all? Did, you know, it's, it's such an, an amazing way to end the piece, but I was always curious, you know, you're in Iceland of all places. What yeah. happens afterwards? And that was really the beginning of the trip. So... Uh -huh. So that was, I mean, the whole thing came together um, in just a, a strange way. Uh, he was freed from prison in Japan. And then uh, he was, you know, granted this extraordinary um, uh, gesture by the Icelandic government, making him a citizen. I think it might have been the first time in Icelandic history, you know, which goes back over a thousand years where they made so. I mean, obviously, you know, they didn't have official citizenship in the Middle Ages, but, you know, basically the first time in Icelandic history where they said, we're going to grant you citizenship to enable him to get out of prison in Japan, where he was on, uh, he was in prison on a passport violation. And then after, and so I get there, you know, I, we find out about this, the producer, John Fish and I, that he'd been freed. So now he's going to Iceland, trying to figure out how long it's going to take for him to get I to Iceland. And we want to be there when he gets to Iceland, because we figure it might be the only opportunity to see him, to interview him. Maybe he'll have a press availability, as unlikely as that sounds. He had had them in the past. Um, and so I called... Um, Glenn Jacobs, uh, whom you know, yes, uh, who worked on MMA and at the time was running features uh, with with a couple of other people at ESPN, and I said, Glenn, this is the situation. Uh, you know, Bobby Fisher is being released from prison. I think we got to be there if we're going to do this story. And and in an instant, he said, Get on the next plane. And there are many places in the world in journalism, uh, in American media, where they would say, Get on the next plane, get a crew. You and John go, meet the crew in Boston, fly. And then in that point, this is before Iceland became a popular destination for Americans for tourism. Uh, there was only one flight a day, hmm. and it was out of Boston, not New York. And so I had to fly to Boston, and it all happened in a couple hours. And then we get to, to Iceland, and the following morning, that night, Bobby Fisher lands, and I'm at the airport. It's in the piece when he lands on a private jet, and then he's whisked away. We have no opportunity to really make, um, you know, uh, to, to speak, to ask him anything, anything like that. And then the next morning, we're just kind of sitting around the hotel, like, what are we going to, you know, what are we going to do? Where are we, what do we do now? You know, thinking we're just going to build a piece without Bobby Fisher in it. And John Barr, our, our, my colleague at ESPN, your former colleague at ESPN, terrific reporter. He had also been interested in Bobby Fisher and he had given me a number, or maybe he'd given it to John, I can't really remember John Fish, the producer, for a friend of Bobby's in Iceland. And he said, you know, call him, maybe he'll have some thoughts. So I call him and he said, we're having a press conference. Like, you're having a press conference? He's like, when are you having a press conference? He's like, now. I'm like, no. Oh, no. And now I'm thinking like, where? He said, at the airport. I'm like, oh my God, the airport, uh, Keflavik is like 45 minutes from downtown Reykjavik. And um, I'm like, we'll never make it. He said, no, no, at the downtown airport, the old downtown airport in Reykjavik. And so we were there. We got there before the press conference started. And that's how it all happened. But then the press conference happens. This is like, you know, we just gotten there 24 hours earlier. And then after that, we're like, what are we going to do? So we spent the next week in Iceland. Um, maybe it was five days, whatever it was, you know, doing other reporting, finding, you know, other voices and talking to other people and trying to kind of construct the story, you know, around that. Um, and, you know, we, I remember having breakfast or lunch with Sammy. That was Bobby's friend. He had been a police officer who was like his bodyguard and was still his friend. I believe he was like the, he was some kind of like ballroom dancing champion uh, as well. Sammy, I think it was Paulson. Am I, make, am I making it up? And, and at that point, you know, there was still interest in trying to get Bobby for a sit down interview. And, um, you know, they weren't going to do it. I, I, I was of two minds about it. You know, I, I think, you know, some people thought, well, you know, you're still over there, you know, and it was just a press conference. Try to sit him down. I was like, you know what? I, I don't know if there's really anything left to be said. Mm -hmm. um, but we tried, but it, it didn't happen. And then we were there for a few more days and we left. 
Did you ever talk to him afterwards? I, I, I know he's no longer around, but was there any interaction with him? No. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that, that, that was it, the press conference, um, which was interesting. Absolutely. And just so inspiring. And uh, you can imagine uh, many years later, I got to do uh, Outside the Lines with you once. I got to do one E60 piece during my brief time at ESPN three years. Feels like a, a fever dream at this point. It happened so fast. And so to be sitting on that desk with you and the other correspondents, but like to hear you say my name and to just be in the same, it, it really felt like I'd want some sort of broadcasting fantasy camp, you know, uh, <laughs> prize or something like that. So it just all meant so much to me. And, and I just really wanted to say that to you up the top and really why I wanted to have you on the program um, so badly and appreciate you doing this. Um, one of the great things about your father is that he is, you know, when people talk about him, when people talk about the stories, I've read them all, uh, the respect that he had from the athletes, right? From the people he covered. And I've, I've heard the stories about, you know, Wilt and him hanging out and he's at his house and people being at your uh, house and you're going to bed and you're coming out of your room to say goodnight and there's, you know, the biggest stars in the world. I'm curious, did you adopt the same mentality? Because I feel like the relationship between journalist and subject, you know, it's changed a lot over the years and, and perhaps something like that would be frowned upon. Do you have those same relationships with athletes? I don't. I really don't. Um, you know, I mean, there's some guys I'm friendly with, but, uh, the way that my, my father, it was a different era and there were, you know, it was much, uh, more, um, typical for the journalist to be friendly, to have those kinds of relationships. And my father was not unique in that respect. Um, but I think it was, um, with him, it was to a greater degree. I mean, he had, you know, uh, a lot of friends who were these athletes and, and the, the whole nature, as you know, of the relationships, it was less adversarial and it was less confrontational. And, um, you know, he, he also had business relationships. You know, if you're going to say the people he was writing books with, with a lot of the most important athletes of the era, you know, he was writing books with Tom Seaver and with Joe Namath and with Jerry Kramer and with Frank Beard and with Bo Jackson. Um, uh, and, and not that, you know, uh, um, there were lines crossed or that, that I think in any way, his journalism, when we reported on those athletes outside of, uh, the book projects they were working on in any way was compromised, but it was, it was a different relationship. And, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's not just the idea that it has to be more adversarial or confrontational. But it's also, you know, now there's so many layers. You know, we don't have access the way that my father's generation had access. You know, I'm not really sure how it works in MMA, um, but in the sports that I've covered, you know, there it's it's just, you know, there there are walls now of agents and managers and publicists, and and, and it's just uh, different. It's also different because, you know the way that sports was approached in that era, and there were certainly serious issues. I mean, my father, you know, I think broke the story that, you know, Muhammad Ali had converted to Islam and had joined the nation of Islam. Uh, so there are big, serious stories that transcended sports that they were covering. But kind of on the daily basis, you know, the kind of stuff that we do now, where all the sports issues, the off the field uh, transgressions, the business of the sport, all of that stuff, there's much more focus on than there was in that era, you know, where it was mostly about the personalities and the events themselves. It, and, um, and so, so it's, you know, it is different. You know, when I was a kid, I would hang out with the Packers of the sixties, the Lombardi Packers, who my dad was close to. And, you know, Tom Seaver, as you were saying, you know, would be at the house. Muhammad Ali would be at the house or, or Walt Frazier, Bill Bradley. Um, I can't think of any, big famous athletes who've been to my house, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, the only one I can think of actually, whoever just called me to chat was Mike Tyson. Really? Um, yeah. Now, when? um, I want to say, I remember where I was, I was up in a certain building in Bristol back in the days when we did like a daily outside the lines in the middle of the afternoon. And I remember I picked up the phone. It was Mike just wanted to say hi. Um, that's really the, now, when my father died, I'll tell you of all the, you know, I'm not including his personal friends, but 
I got phone calls from a couple of guys. Um, but in terms of just calling just to say hi, strangely enough, <clears throat> Mike Tyson's the only one that I can think of. And he just wanted to say hi. There was nothing that he really yeah. wanted. That, was, as I recall. Wow. Yeah. Just one this time? was in an era when I was covering him a lot. Sure. And was it just that one time? Wow. That is amazing. Um, you, you mentioned being around your father a lot. And I'm wondering, like, do you have any recollection of ever wanting to do anything else but what you are doing? Um, yes. I mean, before, you know, before high school, when <clears throat> um, even more than most kids who like baseball or a certain sport, I was obsessed. Like, like baseball was my life, uh, which I think was the title of Frank Robinson's autobiography. And he certainly had more claim to that statement than I did. But nevertheless, I felt that way. Like I was, I was obsessed. And unlike most people, again, I can pinpoint the moment, Ariel, when I became a sports fan. I mean, it had all been, I think my father said, very casual until the night of October 18th, 1977. When I was eight years old, and he took me to game six of the World Series at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, and Reggie Jackson hit three home runs on three straight pitches, and it was like, you know, the cliche, the light bulb turning on, and and it just, it, it, it's one of those things, right? It's so long ago now. I'm 52, right? So it's 44 years ago, and, and they're just like flashes of memory around it, but I do know how it changed everything overnight for me. Like we came home, we probably got home around midnight, 1230, something like that. We were living in Manhattan. And I, you know, I, I remember like now I was suddenly interested in all of those baseball books on my dad's shelf, in our living room shelf, and couldn't stop reading one in particular, Baseball's Best, a Hall of Fame gallery by um, Marty Appel, who had been the Yankees public, uh, public relations uh, boss. And then he, uh, and, and he would become a writer and he's a friend of mine now, Marty. And I always, you know, it, 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 it bothered my father that my favorite writer was Marty Appel. Um, but I became obsessed. Uh, and, and so I guess it's a long way of saying, you know, we all have dreams of being like a baseball player or something like that. But by the time I realized that that was the remotest of impossibilities, not possibilities, uh, I was, I was in on journalism. It sounds like he brought you along a lot, you know, whether he's working at NBC, he's on the road, whatnot. Why do you think he did that? You know, one thing that I've always been afraid of, uh, was to bring my kids like to, to, to mesh family and, and, and work, right? So on the road. So why do you think he brought you along so much? It just sounded like you were just hanging around. Well, it's, it's what we're talking about, right? It's changed. Okay. You know, I have three kids and, you know, I don't – the last couple of years have been impossible, right, because of COVID. And so it's it's been different. But even before – it would just feel different now. First of all, it's not accepted the way it was then, hmm. right? Like if he showed up with me at Shea Stadium, Yankee Stadium, Madison Square Garden those days, it's like, sure, Dick's got his kid. You know, have the run of the place. It doesn't work like that anymore, I think, for anybody, you know, um, because everything post 9-11 changed in terms of security and access, even, you know, for little kids. Um, but beyond that, it's just, it, it, it makes me, I'm not as comfortable with it because of the kind of stuff that I do as a journalist. And, um, it was just, you know, as we were saying, it was a different world. It was more collaborative. You know, my father was as hard nosed as anybody, a very serious journalist. I don't think anyone could deny that. Uh, one of the best, ever at what he did, if not the best. But, you know, when I was a kid, it was just different. Like under the Christmas tree, and we had a Christmas tree, we were Christmas tree Jews. Um, there were gifts, you know, from the North American Soccer League. I mean, they were, you know, they were gestures, you know, it wasn't anything fancy, but like an umbrella or there was something from the Knicks or something from the, and even when I started in the business in the, you know, in the early nineties, it was more like that, you know, um, you know, uh, and, um, so my dad took me everywhere. Uh, we went to a lot of stuff together. And, and I spent my weekends really up at 30 Rock when I was little. He was working at NBC. And then when I was 11, he moved to ABC. And and I I was a, a, a first-class nuisance, Ariel. I mean, I was getting under everybody's feet. I was, you know, always at the office. I was using the copy machines. I was running around. And I think, frankly, it was mostly because, like, the way he worked in his schedule, that was when he would see me. You know, I had to tag along like he wasn't, you know, he wasn't in a position 
to go do stuff with me. He worked every weekend, you know, from the day I was born until the day he died, he worked every weekend. He was never off on the weekends. Um, and my parents got divorced when I, or separated when I was like eight or nine. And so when I see him was really at the office. Your children now, uh, you have three, correct? I have three. Yeah. yeah. Do they want to do what you do? You know, it's not, so I, I have a 12 year old daughter, I have a nine year old son and I have a six year old daughter. And, um, you know, I think they're just kind of wrapping their head around what I do. It's never been articulated quite like that. I think my son in particular thinks my job is cool. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, take him around uh, to the office. He's been up to ESPN maybe once. Of course, it's all pre-COVID, you know, mm -hmm. um, can't bring in kids now. Uh, my daughter's been, my older daughter's been a few times and, and they think it's fun. I guess like, why wouldn't you think it's fun? It's not like, you know, it's not like a real job, Ariel. You know, it's... <laughs> You know, I'm not breaking rocks, right? Um, and it's uh, and that's what it, you know attracted me. I mean, the joke was, you know, I said, well, you know, it, it, if my father could do it, I figured anybody could, so I might as well give it a shot. But um, what could be more fun, right? You're talking right. about sports, and and you get to perform, and you, you know, by being on TV, you get to write. You know, there is, uh, you know, in my case anyway, a very small modicum of recognition. Uh, you know, so there are all the things that, like, uh, for a little kid, would seem uh, appealing. And I guess I just never outgrew that. Uh, uh, would you like for one of them to follow in your footsteps? Oh, you know what? I, I, I really do. And, and again, it's like my dad. I, I mean, he, there was never any pressure from him. There was no sense of like, you should do this or you shouldn't do that. It, it just was what I wanted. Hmm. Um, and I know it's it, it, it sounds, uh, you know, like the kind of thing everybody would say, but really whatever makes them happy. Right, you know, right. if, if, if whatever they want to do, if it's going to make them happy, if they've got no interest in journalism, if they've got no interest in sports, that's great too. As long as they're happy, and you know that, yeah, you know, you, yeah of you're 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 a dad, but you know it would be, I'm sure it would be fun to share that. I got to share things with my dad that we wouldn't have been able to share if we weren't in the same business. You know, we hosted a radio to, show together for years, and we went to all those events, and we knew all the same people, and you know, we, you know, I could, you know, I could bother him every day, like, ah, oh, you know, how should I tell this story? What should I say? You know, how do I approach this? Um, um you know, this, this, this moment in terms of my day or my career or my life. And when you're doing the same thing, uh, you know, you, you have a lot more opportunities, uh, for those kinds of interactions. Right. Uh, I, I know the sporting life show very well. I remember the final episode, October of 2020, you said, uh, our two listeners are going to be very sad to know that this is our final. I was like, wow, I guess I'm one of the two uh, because I loved it. And in fact, and I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable with all this praise, in the very early stages of the pandemic, when there was nothing going on, I went on a massive sporting life binge because Whoa. Everything, yeah, it's true. Uh, I even told our mutual friend Troy this because things were so depressing and the storytelling, and it wasn't any podcast you would listen to in March and April of 2020 was COVID related. And I just wanted to go somewhere else, right? And the storytelling and the guests. So I was going back several years. Thankfully, they had, you know, a long and uh, robust archive. And so that's another thing I want to thank you because I would go on walks when, th you know, when, th when there was no one outside, you know, like the parks were closed and just listen to you and just kind of be like, are we ever going to get back to this? The innocence of these stories and these games. So again, thank you for that. Why, you know, at the, at, at the end of that last episode, you said that it would continue in digital form. That's and, what I was told. Yeah, where is it? It's been almost two years. <laughs> it's Where's the show? Good, it's a very good question. I'm going to have to call Andy Tennant. You know Andy. Yes. You know, he's, he's in charge of that stuff. And, it, you know, they, they tell me it's coming. Uh, okay. So, Willa, uh, you know, the, it's a process, right, Ariel? It's a big sure. company and it's a process. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when do you think uh, people stop recognizing you as Dick's son? Because there are I don't think kids, they have. Serious? There's kids right now who watch you and probably don't know who your that's, father is. That's right. But, right. but not the people who are, you know, older than that. You know, and that's great. That's, You're okay that's, with that? That's, I'm, well, I am. And it's not as if I have a choice. So, right. you know, but, but I, I, it doesn't look, you know, it, it Look, it takes a while to wrap your head around. Like you're walking into an industry in which your father 
is one of the all-time greats and a legend and beloved. And it's a lot to live up to. And you're, they're always going to be comparisons. And most of them, frankly, are going to be comparisons in which, you know, <laughs> you lose, meaning me. Um, but that's a choice I made. And, and, and all of the benefits, all of the ways in which being my father's son, and it's certainly about the access and the privilege and the entree, all of that, but it's also about having been able to learn the business at his elbow, right? At, at his side for so long. And, and I do think um, of all the opportunities I've gotten, uh, you know, because Dick Schapp uh, is my father um, and all the things I've learned, you know, how could I possibly begrudge people for always thinking of him? Uh, when they see me, that's, you know, now, and he's been, he's been dead now for 20 years. The, when, when that happens, I mean, um, and it happens a lot. It's great, right? You know, it keeps my father alive uh, um, to me in another way than all the other ways. When people talk about him with me. Uh, I've always wondered this as well, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. Uh, I was, I was sad to see the sports reporters go away. And I always wondered why you didn't host it. Well, you know, it was one of those things, um, first of all, well, when my father died in 2001, I was, I had just turned uh, 32 and I think, I think it would have been, and people said this to me at the time, like, you know, why didn't you do it? And, and, and I'd been at ESPN for a few years at that point, but I'd only been on the air for five years. I was young and, um, I think it would have been strange. I mean, first of all, John Saunders was a great choice. Sure. John Saunders did a tremendous job until um, you know his very unfortunate and premature death um, in 2016 after having done the show for 15 years. And and, and John was clearly the right choice. Um, and so that was it. You know, so John did it, and it, and it was his job. And um, and then after John died in 2016. And the show, um, the show was only on the air for a few months after that, um, and uh, and I don't know what kind of you know discussions there were about whether you know Mike Lupico, who had been sitting in the chair from the beginning for almost thirty years, was the natural choice, obviously, to be the host after that. And then the show went away. I think it was early twenty seventeen. So so after John died, um, it went away fairly um, fairly quickly after that, and. Um, that was that. And it was replaced by, in the schedule on Sunday mornings, a show that I was co-hosting with Bob Lee, the weekly edition of E60 that we used to do. Mm -hmm. And it, it would have been, you know, what we're talking about, you know, growing up in the business, being in the business with a father who has a certain stature, it would have been, I think it would have been tough for me. I think it would okay. have been tough for me in 2001 to do that show and to, you know, already being in the shadow, naturally. But also the emotion of replacing my father who had died in that chair. Um, I think um, I think the the decision not to have me do it, and I don't know how it was made, but at whatever levels it was made and whatever calculations were made, and first foremost among them, the fact that John would be a great host and better than me at it, number one. But the other things about how it would affect me, those were the right decisions. And what about in 2017? Were there any talks of you? You know, again, no. I mean, it was it was Mike. You know, after after John died, um, it was Mike, and and I thought that was the right call. Uh, you know, Mike. Oh, excuse me for a second, Ariel. Looks like we've got a, a leaf blower outside. Oh, it's all uh, good. Hold on. Can you can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, just fine. okay. Um, uh, you know, I, you know, the way it went, and again, it just happened. It happened so quickly uh, with with E sixty becoming uh, an hourly show, um, and the sport, the decision to can't. Let me just tell. No problem. No problem. It's that time of the year. Sorry about that. No problem at all. Um, and, and that decision to cancel the sports reporters, which you know. I thought was unfortunate. I loved the show. I grew up with the show, you know, went on the air when I was in college. I would spend uh, countless Sunday mornings in the studio with my dad and the guys, oh. and then eventually became, you know, a frequent or a fairly frequent panelist and, and substitute host, you know, 
ah, I love the sports reporters. Um, and, and so I was, uh, you know, I was certainly saddened, uh, by its, its demise. Uh, and at the same time, you know, it's kind of awkward because our show replaced it. Uh, in your opinion, I know you've talked about this a little bit over the years, but currently right now, do you feel as, as like I said, I feel like you're, you're the last of a dying breed in terms of the way you conduct yourself, the way you report on stories. Has social media hurt sports journalism? Do you feel like it has affected it in the, uh, in the wrong way? It's a good question. Um, and, and I'm not, as you know, Ariel, I'm not, uh, you know, a huge consumer compared to some people. I try not to live my life on social media. It's mostly cooking pictures, which I mostly <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> the ex- that's the extent of my participation. And it, it's not just about uh, journalism. And, and since, you know, I'm not in the business of being an information guy, you know, like, like say Adam or, or Jeff or, or Adrian, you know, I don't have to be there. And there are certainly people I know who've chosen not to be there at all, for whom I have tremendous respect, like Tom Rinaldi. Um, I, 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 it's not just the way it affects journalism. I think it's the way it affects everything. I mean, look, it's a great tool. If you want to know what's going on, you've got you've to be following. You've got to have a Twitter feed that you follow, right? Or you, you've got to have your own Twitter account where you can follow accounts and know what's going on. I remember the first time it became a valuable tool for me was in 2009 covering the Tour de France. And at the Tour de France, uh, you know, if you don't speak French, it's very hard to follow along what's going on the race while you're on the road getting to the finish line each day. And I'm like, oh, there's this thing called Twitter. I can follow these people who follow the Tour de France. And I'm actually going to know what I'm talking about when I get to the finish line and Lance has finished first or second or third or whatever. And so that's why I'm like, okay, you need this. But in terms of living on it, and I just think it has a huge detrimental effect on, on uh, mental health for everybody. And I've talked about this with athletes. I mean, I remember talking about this a couple of years ago with Vince Carter, and I think Troy might have been producing that show. Um, and, and you know, he's talking about his young teammates, right, at halftime. And I know, you know, they're look at halftime looking at you know social media and seeing what people are saying about them and being affected by it you know being like oh my god you know and 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 getting in their heads and i just think um that feedback loop is so um it's so dangerous and i think it is dangerous for journalists because so often you are um you know it, it, you should always care what people uh, you know, think about what you're doing because they're the audience, right? Your reader. But, but I think social media has made it so reactive instantaneously that it does, it does affect the way that people write stories, the way that they present stories, the things that they say, because, um, you know, there is a fear, frankly, of, you know, what people on Twitter are going to say. Have you ever considered leaving sports? You know, I was technically out of sports very early in my career. I was working uh, uh, at a local news station in New York, and the job was not a sports job. It was I was basically mostly a cameraman covering breaking news in New York. Uh, was that New York City, One at New York One, right. right? And so it was right when it went on the air in 1992. And at that point, I said, you know what? I'm not sure I want to do the sports thing. I think I want to do news and I'm going to have a great opportunity to start at the station and cover news in New York. And, and it was great education, but I kept kind of gravitating back to the sports stuff and, and covering sports stuff while I was covering news. And, you know, so I'd spend the first part of the night, you know, covering breaking news and going to political events. And, and frankly, you know, it was a lot of crime scenes political events, you know, a lot of what you see on, on local news, on TV. And then at the end of the night, if nothing else like that was going on, I'd go to, you know, there are nine pro teams at that time in, in the city. Um, and, and you would, uh, you know, I'd go to the clubhouses and locker rooms and do interviews and then I'd do some sports stories. And, and then over the years, you know, I've, I've thought about like, you know, mixing in some non-sports here, maybe write a non-sports book 
doing some more non-sports type reporting maybe, um, you know, for our partners at ABC, but it's, you know, it's, it, I've always come back to sports. I've never really left, I should say. Right. Um, obviously one of your first big exclusive breaks, whatever you want to call it, was the Bob Knight interview, um, two decades ago. Uh, I've always wondered about two things with this interview. He gets fired. He essentially, I believe he had three choices as to who would do the interview. He picks you, right? Right. And this is a crazy story. I've heard you tell the story that they they chartered a, a private jet for you. You were in Madison, Wisconsin. Wow, you this, you've oh, yes. done some research here, Ariel. Course, I am Jeremy. impressed. Yes, they they not they that I would the, expect anything less. I appreciate it. Uh, they chartered the plane for you, and you get this big exclusive. People were covering the interview. News outlets were covering right, the interview. It was right. such a big deal, and he insisted on it being live, which Correct. was a fascinating decision because he's you know such a, a firecracker of a personality. But one thing I've always wondered, and again, this is very inside and maybe only people like me would care about this sort of thing. In the midst of the interview, which at times gets a little bit tense and we'll get to one particular moment. <laughs> yeah. Yes, where he's telling you to stop interrupting him and whatnot. You have to cut to commercial. That's you right. have to you have to throw to a commercial break. And it's not often when you're, you know, you're doing an E60 piece, you're sitting down right. with someone, it goes for two hours. What is that commercial break like when you're sitting in front of the guy and now you're off air and he has two minutes to maybe tell you what's really on All his mind? I remember about the break, and and honestly, I, I can't remember if the break came, I think it came after the confrontation or before. I, it I was don't before remember. the confrontation, it but was. it was building. It was building. Yes, okay, I rewatched so the whole it was thing. Before, yeah. So it was all, yeah, you're right. Now I remember it was kind of building. So So we go to break, I throw it to break. And I remember Bob starts, you know, looping the mic out from under his shirt. Oh. And so the truck is screaming. I think it was David Brofsky screaming in my ear, where's he going? Where's he going? They thought he was leaving, that he was done. Like he was done with all of this crap. He wasn't going to take any more questions, but he was just going to the bathroom. <laughs> and so, so, so I knew, but they didn't. So I think I burst an eardrum. Um, and he made it back in time. But, you know, the one thing, well, there were a lot of things if you were watching on TV, you would not have been able to uh, uh, to know about the circumstance. But as I recall, it was it was just very, we're in this like, not a big room. It wasn't like a big room and, and there are curtains all around it now. And so, you know, so that you can't see the cameras and all that. And they're kind of behind the curtains. And as I recall, Bob's wife was behind one of these curtains and I could kind of hear her in the background. Isaiah Thomas was there um, and Digger was sitting off to the side. You know, Digger had really um, brokered the whole thing, you know, mm. because of Digger's relationship with Bob. And he was sitting there too. And it was just, it was surreal, Ariel. You know, I was, I was 31. I just turned 31. I'd been on the air for four years at ESPN and um and it was a big freaking deal you yeah. know and i knew it was a big deal right like i knew going to this like you know this is going to you know this is going to um uh one way or the other <laughs> you know establish uh who you are in the business at least for a while right like either you're going to you're going to nail it and it will elevate you or it's going to be a disaster. <laughs> and you're in, you might as well, you know, go to law school. Um, and uh, so it was a lot of pressure to be under. And I got a lot of good advice from a lot of people that I trusted about how to handle the interview, how to handle the pressure. And, um, and I just had to try to find a place where I could kind of relax and just focus on the questions. I felt comfortable I, I think I, I did to a pretty good degree feel comfortable doing this interview with Bob Knight, even though I was young. I knew him. I knew the story. I knew the issues. I didn't know as well as Bob. You know, you're always at a disadvantage with the subject who's lived it. Um, but I, I knew what questions had to be asked, right? And I knew what follow ups you had to ask. But the live component makes everything different. It's just a different, you know, it's a different animal. And it's not something we deal with. You've dealt with it, you know. Um, I've dealt with it, but the big live sit down with, you know, he was the subject of the moment, right? right? He was the guy that, you know, everybody wanted to talk to, and he has picked me to do it. Um, you know, which uh yeah, I guess I should be grateful for. And uh and uh yeah, I remember uh surviving. 
no greater rush than that big live no. interview and everyone's watching and everyone's like people again people are covering your interview this day and age you get a big interview like that unfortunately you jump on twitter you see what people are saying about it back then there was right. no twitter i would have been hiding under a rock i've said this before if there if twitter had existed at that time I, I i probably would not have survived i mean the the uh you nailed oh, it. It would be too much. But you, you did nail it, and you would have been showered with praise. But I'm wondering, because there was no Twitter, what did you feel about it? Like, how did you feel? Did you walk away from that interview? Do you remember thinking, I, I don't know if I've ever walked away from an interview thinking, I actually have only walked away with regret and upset at myself. You missed this. You no. missed that. You saw, Always. I have never always. hit that home run. I, I never I have. I am not nearly as demanding of myself as you are, clearly, Eric. Uh, you felt good about yourself. You I, felt I like felt you good. It. I felt good. I right. felt good, and I felt good. I mean, not in a vacuum. You know, it's not as if I knew, but I felt good because my bosses uh, told me it was good, and my friends, and my dad. What did your and, dad say to you about it? You know, I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. So I'll, I'll tell you the truth, Ariel. I don't remember. The specifics. I know that it was complimentary. What what I remember, and, and people, to the extent that people remember this at all, what they remember is the parting shot he did that week, which was about it, wow. which was great, and wow. uh, which was really flattering. And, and the gist of it was, and he was being um, generous, but he said he he said that uh, a guy stopped him on the street, or maybe it was a cab driver, and said, "Hey, night was wrong. Your kid's already better than you." And, and he, and he said, I agree, something like that. And he did it better than I could meeting me. And, you know, because of his relationship with Bob, he thought, and, um, and that's what I remember. But I remember, you know, Norby Williamson was there and David Brofsky was there. And, and it was, um, I remember, you know, that, that kind of rush. I mean, it must be, you know, what, what, you know, an athlete feels like in that kind of moment. You know, I remember, I'm a food guy, Ariel, as you know. I remember not being hungry for like a good 36 hours, wow. which is not like me. So I guess there was so much adrenaline that it, it killed my uh, natural hunger. That moment where he breaks the fourth wall and he takes a beat and he looks at you yes. and he says, you got a long way to go before you're as good as you. I mean, I will never forget that. That hit me in the heart. I felt like, a, oh. do you remember how it felt for you? Because you, you you took it. You said, I think you, your response was, I appreciate it. That was all and, I said. Yeah. How did you feel internally when he said that? Again, I'm trying to remember, you know, it would be different, right? If it were tape mm -hmm. and I knew that like, you know, um, there's a moment to recover or there's a moment to think about it or, but you're on live TV and I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm scared shitless anyway. You know, this is a big moment. And then to have that happen, I'm just trying, I'm thinking like, okay, let's keep going with the questions. And, it, you know, in that moment, it never, you know, people would say to me, and they certainly said at the time, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would, uh, leaned over and slugged them. Or, you know, I would have said, well, you got a long way to go to be as good as Dean Smith or, so, you know, something like, and I think that would have been exactly the wrong, obviously the hitting would have been wrong, but any kind of tit for tat, I think in that moment would have been the wrong thing to do. Mm. And, and that doesn't mean it would be wrong now, right? Because now I'm 52 and now, you know, I'm not a kid next to, you know, some legend. Uh, you know, I'm an adult next to whoever it might be. And, and so it's a different dynamic. All these things are different based on the situation. And in that moment, um, you know, I don't think I was deferential. I don't think, you know, I didn't call him coach. You know, it was Bob. Uh, I asked him the tough questions. I think everybody agrees. But I did not want to in any way um, make it personal or continue mm. to have it be personal, which is what, you know, he was doing. And one last thing on this after I'm always curious about the, you know, the goodbye. Was it okay? The goodbye or did no, he tell you? To, no, it was, it was not okay. It wasn't. What, <laughs> that one I do remember pretty vividly. So it's, it's over now. I think I've thrown it back to Bob Lee yeah. in Bristol. And, and I'm thinking like, whew, you know, like I'm alive in the chair and Bob gets up before I get up out of the chair and he, he has to walk past me, as I recall, to get out of the room. So he kind of comes over my right shoulder. I think camera was over the left shoulder. He walks over my, and he kind of like, I'm trying to like pat him like, thanks. 
or, you know, good job, thanks, whatever. And he's like, you've got a lot to learn. Uh, and he turns and walks around, walks away. That was it. That is amazing. That was it. Incredible. Um, this is so much fun. You have a few more minutes? Oh, I got, I got plenty. Okay, We're talking okay. about my favorite subject. Okay, <laughs> yourself. Uh, it's great. Um, how you have done phenomenal reporting on the World Cup coming up, Qatar, all the, uh, the, the, the workers and their, uh, their treatment. I mean, just incredible stuff. A lot of it is online. Anyone can watch it. I have a real moral dilemma that I want to ask you about. How do I handle this, Jeremy? Because I'm a proud Canadian. My soccer team is <laughs> going to compete for the first time that I can... It was only Since once, 1986, yep. yes, but I was four years old. I have no recollection of this. And I never thought in my lifetime that I would see the Canadian men's national soccer team at the World Cup. I always had to adopt another team, right? And not only are they there to take part, like they are a force. They were top of the table, CONCACAF. Like, I think that they can actually, you know, maybe win the group. How do I, how do I, I have a real dilemma here because there's a part of me that if Canada wasn't involved, knowing what I know about the World Cup and how this whole thing has come about due to your reporting, I was going to probably, you know, boycott this whole thing and it would have been easy to do so because it's in November, it's at a weird time. How should I feel about what's happening wow. in November? You know, that, that I haven't been asked and I haven't really considered, you know, um, Look, I, I, I think um, I'm not going to tell you, Ariel, you can't watch the World Cup and you can't watch Team Canada. And look, the World Cup is the biggest event in the world. Literally, you know, I, I think I've said the biggest sports event, but it's just mm -hmm. the biggest event. There's no right. event that's bigger than the World Cup, right? The most people are watching. Most people are invested emotionally. Uh, all the teams, all the drama. It's the world's most popular sport. Um you know, the, the the audiences for the FIFA Men's World Cup are just insane. Um, you know, I've seen it. I've been to the tournament in France, in Brazil, in South Africa. Um, I would say you are someone who cares deeply about these issues. You are someone who's cognizant of these issues. You are someone who's in a position to raise awareness about these issues. And I think that's that's something you can do um in your position um you know while while you still watch the games which are going to take place and and we can say that uh the attention that has been brought to the situation by the fact that the world cup is taking place in qatar has led to change not as much change as there should be um not as much change as we hope uh, might still be affected before the World Cup takes place six months from now. Um, but, but you know, as, as someone with a huge following and a huge platform, you can continue to raise awareness about these issues. And that's what's, that's what's really important. Okay. Um, has there been at this point, and I feel like the answer is no, an event that you haven't covered that you still would like to? Like, is there a bucket list event that's still left on there? Because I feel like there isn't. You know, what have I, you know, in terms, I've been to most of the big things, right? right. Um, you know, I, I have not been to an Indy 500. Okay. Um, and I'm not a big Indy car guy, don't get me wrong. I've been to the time trials, but I haven't actually been to the race, but that's, you know, one of the iconic things, but I've gotten to cover so many things, you know, Ariel, so many things, winter and summer Olympics, uh, Euros and, and World Cups and Tour de France's and I've uh, it's it's I've been very fortunate. Is there one that stands above the rest, like your favorite one to cover? You know, I've I've loved some of the Olympic experiences that I've had. Um, I, I I was more enthusiastic about the games be before I became more cynical about the International Olympic Committee. Um, and, um, you know, some of the decisions that it's made over the years don't sit well with me or with many other people. But I remember the first Olympics I attended in Alberville in 1992 and the thrill of that. Uh, and my father was an Olympic historian. It was near and dear to his heart. You know, he wrote at least a few books about the Olympics and Olympians. Um, and, uh, um, so the Olympics have been big, 
The Tour de France is a great experience when I was covering it in terms of just the opportunity to drive around France for a couple of weeks, seeing all these places you wouldn't necessarily see otherwise, small towns, small villages, the event. It's like, I try to describe it to people. It's like, it's like the Super Bowl, 20 consecutive days, you know, in 20 different locations, setting up a new day, three weeks in a row. And it's, um, it's fun. And when Lance was in it, you know, it was a big, big deal here in the US. Mm. And we cared a lot about it in ways that we don't care about it otherwise. Um, you know, the, the Euros have been great. Uh, last year, I went to Wimbledon. It's only a second Wimbledon I covered, which is great in the US Open. I mean, I, I it's been... Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've never covered a Masters either. I've been to the Masters, but I didn't cover the Masters. Uh, I'm not sure they're going to invite me back though. So the one time I was there a few years ago, I was asked to speak speak to a small group um, uh, and I had not been told that I was expected to speak. And you know, they said, well, just get up and talk for a few minutes about the Masters, you know, say whatever you want to say. And the only thing that occurred could have occurred to me was telling the audience uh, that my sister, uh, Rosie, had been conceived at the 1970 Masters. Um, so, <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, uh, so I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm getting to go back, uh, which is true. I, I wasn't just yeah. making that up. You can do the Masters. She was born January 13th, 1971. Um, <laughs> and so there have been so many great ones, so many fun ones. Uh, just a couple more left. Have you ever been close to leaving ESPN? You know, we mentioned a lot of names here. None of them are still with the company. Uh, wow. You know, you've 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 lasted including a very Bob long time. Knight, including uh, Bob Knight. That's, that's right, right. Who would become my colleague that's at ESPN right. for a number of years? Um, you know, I I haven't. I haven't. Uh, it's been uh, I've been working at ESPN for twenty nine years, Ariel. Wow, and. Uh, you know, I always say this. I mean, the things I've gotten to do, the stories I've gotten to cover, the places I've gotten to travel to, the people I've been able to work with, such as yourself and Troy. Um, if I could have picked one place in the world, like it, it, with with hindsight or foresight or whatever you want to call it, in 1993, this is where you're going to work. You know, for the next 30 years and hopefully beyond. For me. Um, Knowing everything now that I've been able to do, and and um, and also ESPN stature, uh, I would have picked ESPN. Hmm. And uh, I, I'm just I'm just very lucky that they've uh, uh, you know they haven't gotten around to uh, figuring out that they're done with me. So you know, <laughs> it's it's been great. Are you able to watch your your old stuff? Like the. the I find pain in watching my old stuff. I, I find a lot of mistakes. It's it's hard. Um, I'm not saying that it's something that you would enjoy doing. You don't sit at home and just watch your highlight reel, but are you someone who's able to watch and enjoy your earlier work? Um, yeah, it depends. I mean, there isn't there aren't a lot of things. You know, I I, I don't have um tapes of most of my pieces. I don't have you know, everything exists. You can pretty much find everything if you need to, but I don't have like a big library of it. There are a lot of pieces that I could find online. I, I can't say that I, I um, listen to a lot of it or watch a lot of it. It's been a, a long time, but there's some things when I flipping channels and I see a certain show that I did uh, that I might watch for a few minutes that I like where I'm like, okay, my voice isn't super annoying to me in this one. Like I tracked that one well. Um, and if they're just subjects that I still, uh, am fond of, like did a show about, um, Drew Bledsoe a few years ago, which yeah. I really enjoyed. I think yeah. that's a pretty good one. So if I see that, you know, I'll watch it. Did one about Bobby Hurley a few years ago, which is also one of my favorites. Uh, if I see that, I might watch a few minutes, but I'm not, you know, necessarily calling it up. The, the Buster Douglas documentary that we did a few years ago, 42 to one, I really, I really like that Fantastic. show. Yeah, I'll watch that. Um, uh, but but not. I know everybody says they don't, but not not much. No. Okay. Do you have uh, a favorite piece? Yeah, I think it's it's probably the well. Look, I think the piece that um, in some ways means the most to me on a personal level is the piece that we did uh, about Bobby Fischer. You know, mm -hmm. it still resonates, and you know, even in the moment, I kind of remember like that was different, right? Like that, you're not going to get many 
stories like just like you're not going to get many opportunities to do interviews like the Bobby Knight interview in your career you know there you're not going to you're not going to find many stories like this um and, and be able to tell these stories uh that many kind but but the story journalistically um that I think I'm most proud of are still the stories that we did around FIFA and Qatar in 2014 and 2015 the Qatar piece and and the FIFA documentary the following year which you know, kind of told the story of FIFA in the Sepp Blatter era. Uh, not a pretty story. And I think those were really uh, well-conceived and well-executed and certainly very well-produced um, uh, by my colleagues, B and Gim and Mike Johns. And, uh, you know, I think those were, I think they were important stories. Um, and, and, and that's what you want to do. You, you want to tell important stories and you want people to see them. And, and uh you know, that's what happens on ESPN. People see them, uh, fortunately, and you can uh, you can try to make a difference. Last one. Uh, you're still a very young man, so I'm not trying to push you out, but <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you have an end date in sight? Like, do you, do you, do you just want to go until you're, God willing, 120 or? I definitely, I don't know 120, but I've never, you know, I hear people talk, look, my my good friend. One of my closest friends, you know, Bob Lee, he retired a couple of years ago at 64. Mm-hmm. And Bob would be the first to tell you he's loving it, right? Yes, he okay. <laughs> he's loving it. Um, and I'm still a long way off from 64. Maybe I'll yeah. feel that way when I'm 64, but I'm 52. Very long way off, I should say to Bob. I hope I'll, I'll send this to him so he knows, you know, that I'm emphasizing. Um, you know, my dad, when he died, he was 67, but he was still working as hard as he'd ever worked. And work was uh, fundamental to him. You know, he, he even in a business full of workaholics, he was kind of like, "Oh yeah, that guy." Right. And I'm not saying that's great or it's um, uh, necessarily how you want to live your life. But uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not wired quite like him in that respect. But to me, it really, it still doesn't feel like work. It's still a pleasure. And and if they're gonna afford me the opportunities to keep doing this kind of work. Yeah, I think I want to keep doing it. <laughs> and 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 you look around the industry and that's not always the story. Bob's a very good example. Um but you know, you look at, you know, the people t- to me who are, you know, the legends, the people I grew up, you know, admiring in the business, you know, they kept working. They kept working, you know, whether it's, you know, um Ted Koppel got out a little bit, but he's still working. So Ted Koppel hasn't got out. He's doing important work, you know, on CBS Sunday morning, he left Nightline, you know, uh, 16, 17 years ago. Mike Wallace was doing 60 Minutes up until his late 80s. Maybe I'll, I'll tell you this story. So um, I knew Mike Wallace a little bit, right? I'd met him a few times. People had made introductions. And my grandfather, my mother's father, had produced a show that Mike Wallace hosted in the 1950s. Wow. And so he was one time close with my grandparents, my mother's parents. And so, you know, when I'd see him, you know, the very rare occasions when I got to meet him, you know, he, we talked about my grandparents. And I remember this is years ago, obviously, because Mike Wallace uh, is, has not been with us for a number of years, but I saw him at an airport. It was Newark and, um, and it was a deserted terminal fairly late at night. We must have both been taking red eyes. And I remember he was flying to Beijing to interview the Chinese premier. I can't remember at the time what year it was, who the premier was. And he's by himself and he's in his 80s. And and he's looking like, you know, he's had a long day and he's about to get on like a 12-hour flight. (laughs) And and I went up to say hello and reminded him, you know, who, you know, my grandparents, you know, were, you know, I said Lester Gottlieb's grandson. And he said, oh, and how is your grandmother, Henrietta? And I said, "Uh, well, you know, uh, she died a number of years ago, Mike. Um, and he said, oh, you know, well, I'll be with them soon. Wow. <laughs> you know, my Jeez. grandparents, I'm just like, wow. and of course I say like, no, Mike, you look great. You get, you yeah. get on a plane to fly to China. What are you talking about? Of course, I walked away a minute later and I said, oh, what I should have said was, well, please say hi for me. <laughs> um, but that's always what, you know, occurs yeah. to you later. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm just thinking, look at what he's doing. Look at how he's working. And I look at Ted Koppel, who's really, uh, you know, uh, and I, I've only interviewed Koppel once, but we've communicated a few times. My hero, like, uh, you know, my dad worked at ABC and Koppel was just so great at everything he did. And, you know, and, and Ted Koppel's got to be, I, I don't want to, probably late seventies at this point, I would say, if not, um, and he's still doing great work. And, uh, 
So I don't know. I'm not, I'm not thinking about retirement yet. Maybe someone has got my retirement in mind, but I no. don't. Well, that is great news. I, I cannot thank you enough for this. Uh, a massive, massive thrill and honor for me. I could have uh, peppered you with questions for hours here, but we'll leave it at that. Um, and honestly, uh, no regrets about my time at ESPN. Obviously, the initial goal was to last a little longer, but it all worked out for the best. And when people ask me about my highlights there, there are three that I mentioned. None of them have to do with MMA, to be honest. Uh, one was getting to live out my dream of being an NBA sideline reporter for a few games. That was cool. And the other two are because of you, getting to be on the OTL set and getting to do the E60 piece because of who you are and what you have meant to people like me, an inspiration, a role model. So thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for that Bobby Fischer piece that really shaped the way I tried to conduct myself in those tense moments. And congratulations on, on all that you have accomplished. And I can't wait for you know the next... 30 or so years of work that you're going to produce. It's, it's, uh, it's really a joy to, to be a fan of yours and to watch your work. And uh, you don't have a bigger fan than me, honestly. So thank you so much for this. You're a good man, Ariel. And uh, I can't thank you enough for all those kind words. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Ariel Hawani Show. If you want to check out some of our old episodes or if you want to stay up to date with all the great things that we are doing here, please do like and subscribe to this year page. Trust me, some really cool things are coming up.